Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us um, for another MedStar Golf Medicine Education Series segment. And this evening, we are honored to invite David Hudsilt, who is a recent PGA champion, along with all these other credentials that he has that's up on here on the board. Um, thank you for joining us. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Hinton to get us started for this evening. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking some time, Willis. And uh, as Lou was saying, this is the third of our uh, biannual uh, MedStar Golf Medicine Education uh, Series. Uh, we were very lucky last year in our two meetings to start things off with Greg Rose, who is the uh, founder of Titleist Performance Institute out in the San Diego area. That's really a national leader in education uh, in golf. And Greg is a, a Maryland native. He's a chiropractor here in Maryland for years before going out to the West Coast. Uh, Kyle Berkshire, the uh, world's long drive champion from 2019 and 2021, then spent the evening with us as our second lecture, very entertaining. He also a Maryland native. And tonight we're lucky to have another Maryland native with us, uh, David Hutzel, who is currently the head professional at, at Pine Ridge, but has been a teaching professional at several clubs here in the central Maryland area, Woodhome and Elk Ridge, and has taught uh, down in uh, Hilton Head uh, as well. And, and David has had great success as both a player uh, and as a teacher. So we're gonna be able to touch on all of those things tonight. Um, Dave, again, thanks for taking your time. I know you got a lot going on at Pine Ridge with some of the new educational equipment. I, we're going to talk about that tonight and how you see that helping the average golfer. Uh, David went to Tyson University, was actually a baseball player there and transitioned from baseball over to golf uh, in his early 20s. I believe he had an elbow injury during baseball. So so Dave, maybe you could start us out just telling us a little bit about how you came to golf at a relatively high level, but maybe a little later as it not being your primary sport, how that elbow injury might have gotten you out of baseball and did it affect you in your early golf career at all? And then we'll wow. talk about some of this uh, just outstanding play you had uh, have had with the PGA uh, of America. So tell us a little bit about getting into the game. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Hinton, for having me. And, um, you know, it's, it's an honor to be here. I, I, you know, my golf career was a little different than most, uh, I would say, who, um, who have become PGA professionals like myself. Uh, like you said, I was a baseball player growing up and uh, had an older brother who also played baseball. Um, my dad helped coach, uh, played from, you know, Little League all the way up through three years of college. And, uh, I think baseball was very important in my athletic growth. I also played basketball, played a little bit of soccer, you know, played everything in the backyard with my brothers, my neighbors, and uh, was just, you know, trying to be well-rounded. But uh, eventually, like you said, in, in college, after uh, playing a few years, developed some elbow issues, uh, had some bone chips, bone spurs uh, from, from basically pitching for several years. Um, so after my junior year at Towson, had my elbow cleaned out. I was fortunate that uh, I didn't need Tommy John surgery, just had, you know, kind of stretched ligament there and um, decided, you know, it was kind of time to go in another direction. Uh, when I, you know, a couple of years prior, I started working on a grounds crew during the summer at Mount Pleasant Golf Course. Um, my roommate and I said, you know, we got to find a job this summer <laughs> and went over there figuring we can make a few bucks. And uh, next thing you know, I was, I mean, I played golf as a junior, never any organized golf or, or tournament golf per se, just play with my dad, my brother, and you know, my uncles. Um, you know, we were just talking about Ruggles uh, a few minutes ago before we came on with March. And, and you know, I grew up playing at Ruggles and, and uh, my dad was retired Navy. So we had privileges on the base and um, you know, used to just go beat it around with him and, and whoever else would play with me and, uh, wasn't great, but, you know, was figuring the game out. And then when I got into college and I started working at Mount Pleasant, we had some really, really good players on our maintenance crew, believe it or not, guys that dabbled on the Ben Hogan tour back then, which is now a corn Ferry tour right. and some really, you know, good scratch players. So 
kind of hung out with them, played as much as I could. And eventually uh, my focus started to lean a little bit more towards golf. And, you know, with my injuries in baseball, I wasn't playing every day like I did, you know, the first couple of years. And, um, you know, started to really, really kind of change focus. And, um, you know, my after having surgery, um, I decided to uh, go out for the golf team at Towson. They had dropped the program several years prior, and um, they decided to revive the program in 1993. So went out, walked on, and, and made the team. Somehow, it's about a three or four handicap back then. And, uh, you know, we weren't great, but we, we had a lot of fun. And, and I got some experience, some very good experience. And I was working on my degree in physical education and uh, kind of decided at that point, I said, you know what, uh, I've been in and around the golf business, got to know Jim Deck, who was the head pro there at the time, and, and kind of thought, you know what, I might want to give this a shot. So after getting my degree, I, I decided to work at a club and uh, was lucky enough to get an assistance job at Bonnie View Country Club over in Pikesville and worked there for a season. Then decided to go south, went to Hilton Head for a few years, gained a lot of experience there. And tons of golf pros there. Trust me, you can always find a game after work or before work if you right. want to play, try to, uh, you know, test your chops. So it was it was great experience and uh, eventually moved back to Maryland, my wife and I, and uh, started working up here at Willow Springs Golf Course, did a little bit of teaching there, kind of got more into that at that point. And, um, you know, the game started to progress. I was taking lessons when I was in Hilton Head with a, with a great teacher down there, helped me a lot with my game. And, um, you know, eventually, you know, just getting battle tested, you know, playing with better players than I was, and then getting involved more in the tournament, tournament program with Mid-Atlantic PGA. Um, you know, eventually, game got better and better and I was I was fortunate enough to have some nice successes over the years right well look I think people you know from the title slide uh if they they don't know look you had a great year 2010 2011 uh won the uh middle Atlantic PGA section and then went on to win the national tournament you were the national play of the year Played two majors uh in 2011 and 2012 uh the PGA uh, you followed that up recently by uh, winning the senior middle uh, um, Atlantic uh, PGA section for seniors and uh, just recently played in the senior PGA. If I've got my calculations right, though, it seems like you might have been playing your best golf when you were in your early 40s. Which That's correct. to everybody on this call and to me, I mean, I'm a little bit past 40, but still the concept of being able to progress in your game, not when you're just 18, 19, 21, 22, but I mean, really, you were playing some top level golf when you were in your early 40s. How did that come about? Did, were you able to take more time to practice? Did your game, because you started late, just needed to mature more? Or what facets of your game allowed you to be at the tip of the spear, really, in your early 40s, when a lot of people's game is going down, not going up? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think experience really is um, the biggest factor. Um, I didn't like I said, experience as much of the junior golf. Um, you know, I, I kind of jumped almost into professional golf right away. Uh, I played in a few amateur events here with Baltimore pub links and, and those things just a couple of times before turning professional. And so maybe I didn't have as much of the, uh, you know, scar tissue, so to speak, that some of the guys do. I didn't have the burnout maybe that some of the junior golfers sometimes deal with today. Um, so, you know, getting, getting my reps in, in my later years in my twenties and thirties, um, you know, I, I worked at some great clubs and I was fortunate enough to actually play full time for a couple of years, uh, in the early two thousands, uh, played the golden bear tour in Florida, played the Hooters tour for a season, traveled, you know, you know, 72 whole events, pro-ams, all the, you know, things that 
can help you really develop as a player. Uh, had, you know, moderate success there, did Q school a few times and uh, wasn't able to get past second stage. So, you know, I think one of the biggest things for me uh, after going through that was I just kind of gained some perspective. Um, you know, I knew that the tour wasn't really going to be my my route in life, I guess you could say. So I went back to work and, and, I, and I worked on my craft as a PGA professional, as a teacher, and still was able to keep that competitive spirit. Uh, I was fortunate to have great positions at the Elk Ridge Club, Columbia Country Club, Woodholm, where I was able to play and still compete because it's almost like having two jobs. It really is. You're, you have your, your job at, at the club and then you have your job as being a golf professional as a player. And it takes time and uh, been very fortunate. My wife and family have uh, allowed me to do that. But uh, I think that perspective, um, you know, knowing that if I, you know, have a poor round or, you know, a bad hole or a bad shot, it's not the end of the world. Um, and, you know, you don't always have that in your 20s. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're so focused on it. You don't see sometimes the big picture. And I think I was fortunate to kind of gain that perspective kind of in my later 30s early 40s so tell us just a little bit i mean you've been teaching golf i mean you've obviously had success as a player look one thing i'll also give you credit is i was looking at your resume your major wins have come from behind as well you've uh mm -hmm. you know you went a playoff when you won the 211 national championship uh I think you came from behind in this senior win your maryland open win you came from behind so I think that speaks to some mental toughness of sticking in and, you know, finding your places and being patient, maybe when a lot of other people aren't. And I love your history as everybody on the, on the line knows from working with me at MedStar. I love the concept of kids playing multiple sports and transitioning and picking up and not, you know, single sport participation as much for the mental side as the physical breakdown. And tell us a little bit about the teaching side of uh, the PGA. Uh, you must have seen a huge transition in what is expected of a teaching professional by your customer over the 30 years you've been teaching about what the customer expects. So what I'd like to hear, we'd like to hear from you is a little bit about how it has changed and then how can we be good customers when we go to a teaching professional? I know if we could all find time on your schedule, we'd be guaranteed a great experience. But from a consumer standpoint, what should we be looking for in a teaching pro the first time we meet them, how we should interact, what our expectations should be? Well, I think uh, one of the most important things obviously is you have to be a great communicator. Um, you need a, a, a large, you know, uh, or a wealth of knowledge, but, you know, the knowledge is great, but if you can't communicate that to your student, then there's going to be a gap there that uh, is, you know, going to probably hinder your success. Uh, so I think, um, you know, my perspective as, as a quote unquote player also, uh, when someone comes to me and, you know, they're talking about their round and what's going on, you know, with their ball striking or their mental side of the game. Um, you know, when a teacher has that type of experience, you know, they're able to, I think, relate a little bit better. Um, but uh, it's not all about playing, but I mean, it's a game we play for life. And if we want to play well, there's going to be a lot of hard work that goes into it. And, uh, you know, personalities have to have to work. Um, and, and I've taught tons of different players over the years, obviously. And, you know, going back to what you were saying before, I think our, our audience or our customers as, as students are much more educated than they were 20, 30 years ago when I first got into business. You know, back then it was magazines. Everybody was reading magazines. You know, there was golf programming, but there was no golf channel. So, you know, they, they read magazines, they talked to their friends, uh, their fellow, fellow golfers. But now with YouTube, I mean, people are, are getting such a, a massive, massive amount of information that it can be quite confusing at times. Um, so it's, it's important as a golf professional that you can kind of narrow their focus sometimes because uh, 
you know, the latest and greatest isn't for everyone. You know, we need to understand what's going to make this player better. And it may not be the same thing that makes that player better over here. Um, you know, we all, I love to watch golf on TV, whether it's the guys, the ladies, the seniors, and, you know, from being around that, the, the you know, this dozen or so times I've been able to out on tour, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of mental um, preparation that the average, you know, player doesn't really go through. Um, it's, it's, they have their issues also. I've seen it, you know, seen the frustration on the range. I mean, they're the best players in the world. They get upset, they get angry, they get frustrated just like we do. Um, but, you know, they, they work at it a little bit more than we do most times. And that's why you see them on TV and we're not most of the time. But finding the right instructor, um, you know, is, is extremely important. Um, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have you know, hundreds and hundreds of students over the years. And, you know, that's, that's what, you know, one of the biggest things I've gained from this sport is just that ability to help others that, that really makes my day. Um, when they call me or text me or stop in the shop and say, Hey, had my best round today. It's right. extremely rewarding. And, um, you know, just having that, openness being able to you know discuss whatever it is about their game and finding that that next thing to work on to make them even better so what sort of um time commitment if somebody's coming in and they play an occasional game of golf maybe they play once a month there you know and they want to get to where they've got a solid recreational game that they can take out and play once or twice a week and have fun and have it look like a golf game. Um, what sort of time commitment would you say? Is it, should you come in and meet your pro the first time and talk about your goals and objectives and then maybe meet with them every other week or once a week? Or I know there's a lot of homework to be done that humans by nature don't like to do, that you need to tell us what we need to practice and go off and do it. But how long should that initial commitment be, you think? Well, I think goal setting is really important and um, everyone in this game has different goals, whether it's, you know, breaking a hundred, breaking 80, winning your club championship or, you know, competing in, you know, in some serious tournament golf at the amateur <laughs> or even professional level. Um, so I think, you know, one of the most important things for a student or a player to be able to do is really manage their expectations. And it's frustrating to go out and play poorly, but if you haven't put the time and the effort into it, you shouldn't be all that surprised. I mean, there are those, that small group of people and players that can, you know, just incredibly gifted and they make it happen. But for the average player, you've got to put the time into it. And, you know, it's, you have to sacrifice other things uh, to put in that practice time and effective practice time. Just going to the range and beating balls is not going to make you better. You have to have a, a practice plan. You know, how much time you're going to spend on your short game, how much you're going to spend on putting and how much you're going to spend on ball striking. And then obviously course management. I think that's one of the things that gets overlooked a little bit in our business is you know, golf courses are busy and, you know, getting that time on the golf course to play three or four holes with a student uh, or even nine holes. You know, if you have time, that's where you're going to really see um, some bigger changes because, you know, I've, I, you know, I've worked with students who stripe it on the range and then they go to the golf course and they can't keep it in play. So, you know, one of the old sayings you've probably heard before, the longest walk in golf is from the practice tee to the first tee. So being able to take that, that swing, you know, take it to the golf course and get it around and, and put a good number on the scorecard is, is a little bit more challenging than some, some realize at times. Right. Well, uh, Justin and I were kicking around a question today that I think is fascinating. And if you're working with high level athletes and high level golfers all the time, it's one thing. You've had the luxury of doing that, but also the necessity of working with a lot of people with an average skill set. Uh, I'm very interested in anthropology, both physical and cultural anthropology. And, you know, humans are built 
to be good mid-level distance runners. That's what our bodies are made for. We're very elastic and we absorb energy and release energy in the environment. I've always been curious and I'd like to hear your thought about if you put a golf club in humans' hands, 90% of the people come over the top and slice the ball. It mm -hmm. seems that a vast majority of humans, if they're given a golf club and a little bit of instruction or if they picked it up on their own and I'm guilty, come over the top and lead with the upper body in their swing. And I've often wondered, is that something about physical limitations or not being able to tie the legs and hips together with the trunk because of a weak midsection in a lot of people? Or in my game, I find out that if I get the club too high in my backswing, I have this like hit reflex that I get up there and all I can think about is hitting down at the ball. But and I've always wondered if you picked up golf early as a child and it's a little more carefree or you're a little more less worried about it, are you able to put a more athletic move on the ball? So why do you think we as a group as humans are not swinging the golf club innately better and so often come over the top and have to come to see you to start the swing from the ground up and through the legs and not the upper body? Well, that's a great question. And I come across this often. And one of the things I like to do with a student and, you know, the, the interview process in the very beginning, one of the first things I ask them, what else have you done athletically? What other sports have you played? Whether it's lacrosse or basketball or baseball or football, whatever it is, that gives me an idea right away you know, what they've done in the past and how I can relate that to what I need them to do with the golf swing and what I need their body to do. And oftentimes what I'll ask a player to do or a student, I'll say, I'll hand them a ball and I'll say, throw a ball to that target for me. And they don't even think twice. They take a step with right. their lead foot if they're right-handed, plant their left, post up, and they rotate and they throw the ball. And the hand is the last thing to come through with the ball and they throw it perfectly. And they put a golf club in their hand and the club head wants to come first. So, you know, th their weight does not get to their lead side. They hang back, they flip it, or they just simply, like you said, come over the top. So getting them to understand the proper sequence and walking them through that slowly. And then, you know, many times it'll click pretty quickly. Sometimes it doesn't. And we've got to go through it a little bit slower. But I think, you know, we... In golf, you know, we're, we're so focused on the target and some players are thinking swing towards the target. They get the club moving too early arms. They're more arm, you know, biased in their golf swing instead of letting the body lead. Um, you know, I, I like to say the body leads and the arms and club follow and they do that naturally without a club in their hand. So we're adding another element to this physical movement and it throws some people off right away. And once you get them to a position where they feel like, okay, this club is going to make it around eventually and they can trust it, <laughs> then, then, then we're going to see some success. But until they build that trust and understand that, yes, my body does need the lead and the club will eventually make it around to the golf ball, you know, it can be challenging at times, but, um, you know, that, that pattern, just getting them to understand where we need the club to move, um, and, and, you know, it's, like I said, it's a process getting it through them mentally and then physically, um, you know, one of the old sayings in golf is we aim to the left, we swing to the right, and we walk down the middle. And until we understand that that club needs to be moving right of target before we make contact, and then eventually at the target and left of the target, most are trying to get that club moving at the target too soon. So if we can change that pattern, change that sequence, we can really see some improvement and how the club's going to approach the golf ball. So uh, I know that we were talking earlier about how teaching has changed. <clears throat> What's your advice to the average player about incorporating technology into their improvement? Uh, as you said, I'm sure the pendulum swings both ways. People can get way too tied up in it. People can ignore it and not use it. I know you all have made an investment uh, 
in some technology out at uh, Pine Ridge. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit. I'm, I'm interested because I'm sure you as a head professional were key in making the decision that that was a good investment for the club and for the players of the ability that are out there. And I'm sure part of that is to have fun and to bring people out there and they can play different courses and play with their buddies. But there's also a teaching component. So kind of walk us through your thinking and what you wanted to achieve with the new system you have there and what the capabilities are for the audience that might come out of it. Well, I think, you know, the most important thing is we're, we're adding to the experience here, um, but it, it's whether you want to do it just for fun or whether you're going out there to, to really work on your game and you can come out here as a, as a junior and and play go fish and just hit shots and you know have fun that way and but you know for the for the really good player or the player that's looking to improve their game obviously we're giving them numbers we're giving them carry distance we're giving them total distance we're giving them launch angle we're giving them curvature all those things and you can you can actually you know do a a uh, an assessment on on the program the top tracer to really help you see where your strengths and weaknesses are and what I've always found is, you know, players in general like to practice what they're good at. You know, if they, if they drive it really well, they're going to go out there and bang a bucket of balls and they're going to be the majority drivers. And you put a wedge in their hand and ask them to hit a 40 yard wedge shot and they have no chance. So yes, they're going to be great drivers of the ball, but you know, to score, we got to have a well-rounded game. So, you know, the ability to come out here, do an assessment like that uh, with top tracer is great. And then, you know, some of the fun target games. I mean, you can do closest to the pin contest. You can do, you know, different golf courses. I, you know, when we first brought it out, I was out here with my daughter and we were playing the seventh hole at Pebble Beach. Just, you know, just hitting shots, 80, 86 yards or 90 yards or whatever it was, depending on the hole location. And just, just having a blast, you know. But at the same time, you know, you're dialing in your numbers. And golf is a target-based game and we need to hit the ball a specific yardage. And that's what this system is going to do for, for anyone that wants to use it is, you know, when you hit, when you're on the golf course, you're standing in the fairway and you've got hundred yards to a front hole location, but there's 94 yards or 92 yards to carry a bunker. You don't want to hit it 91 yards. You need to hit it a hundred yards or just past a hundred yards. So, you know, being able to comfortably stand in the fairway and know what your yardage is with each and every club, that's how you're going to end up playing better golf. You're going to be able to carry the ball proper distance, get it pin high. If it's a little right or a little lap, great. That's fine. But carrying the ball the proper distance is going to save you a lot of strokes, save you a lot of golf balls too, if you're hitting over water. Right. Uh, another thing we, we were just talking about, how innately maybe this study, um, I do get the sense that a very important part for golfers trying to get better is this concept of a pre-shot routine and that being very important in settling them mentally but also for me the concept of either mental motion or some physical key that is motion because I get wigged out by the ball sitting still I mean I played baseball and played a lot of sports but the concept of the ball sitting still it's hard for me. So I almost have to get moving before my swing really gets moving. But tell us about how you would talk to somebody about developing a pre-shot routine and the necessity of really practicing that when you play and importantly, when you practice. Uh, I think it's extremely important. Uh, I was teaching a young man just this past weekend and, uh, you know, We've got, obviously, we're on the range, got a tray full of balls there, and we're working on some wedge wedge work. And, uh, I mean, this kid is just firing them off. I mean, he's hitting three, four balls a minute. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, you know, if you're, if you're just, you know, trying to get a feel for distance, that's one thing, but this is not how we play golf. I said, I want you to show me your pre-shot routine. I know it's going to take a little longer in your practice time, but, you know, there's a period of your practice where you really need to focus in on this and have him get behind the ball, pick his target, walk into it, take his stance, get his grip correct. And he's a good player. You know, he's, he's pretty close to a single digit right now as a, as a pretty young junior, but 
you know, it's easy in the range setting to just rake another ball over and whack away, but that's not how we play golf. So when we get on the golf course and all of a sudden now we're, we're thinking a little bit more, it can, it can kind of mess with, you know, your, your process. So, um, taking that time in your practice on the range, whether it's range or putting, um, you know, it should be like clockwork. I mean, as soon as you decide what club you're going to hit from the time you walk up to the ball and hit it, it should be almost exactly the same. You watch the best players in the world. They're very consistent and a consistent routine is going to produce consistent results. Right. So look, we're, uh, part of the, uh, sell tonight was some tips for the off season about game improvement or keeping your head in the game. Now, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, uh, a lot of people have access to inside facilities this time of the year that probably wasn't available, obviously, when you were early in your career and even out at your place. I mean, there, there's uh, it's covered and unless it's really howling rain, you can get out there in it. So people do have mm -hmm. access to simulators and stuff in the off season, but if we're at home and we got a wall to get up against or we can get a club in a basement, uh, what are some things that you might have people practicing on over the, over the winter months, both mentally and physically that can help them win the game when spring comes back around? Well, um, you know, I wanted to kind of go over a little bit with putting this evening and, okay. um, you know, you don't need a huge space for putting. And I think, um, you know, it's so important. We got to get the ball in the hole. So why not talk a little bit about putting routine, um, sure. just set up. Uh, so I've, I've got a little station set up here. I purchased this uh, little mat here a few years ago at the PGA show. And I've got a couple little training aids um, from Eyeline Golf, um, putting mirror. So basically, you know, setup is key. And, and, and if we can get ourselves set up consistently. So I've got some lines on the mirror. I hope you can see that from there. Uh, and I've got my ball placed here uh, in this little little slot. But as you can see, there are a lot of lines on this mat. And that helps me kind of focus a little bit better on my target, helps me make sure that I'm getting set up properly. And you don't have to go out and buy one of these mats. It's, you know, you can use a towel. I tell people all the time, put a towel on the ground. It's a rectangle. Just measure it for size. And, you know, if you're just using a towel and you get fine, a, a, a straight edge and you can just practice your stroke along that straight edge using your shoulders making your stroke it's it's just training your eye training your, your stroke but as I get set up here you know I've got different distances I've got three feet six feet um, and what I want to do is make sure when I get set up I want my eyes over or just inside the target line I've got some flex in my knees and my hips my arms are relaxed. There's some bend in my elbows and I'm looking down at this mirror at this point and I see my eyes are in between these two lines, which is a good spot for me. I can also see my ball position inside my left heel here. And I can also see that my club face is square. So as I get set here, I want to feel as though the palm of my right hand facing the target, the back of my left hand is facing the target. So they're matched up, they're ready to go. And then once I get set, as I go through my routine, I like to do a couple practice strokes just quickly. Um, so I'm looking at my target. I'm getting a feel for the pace at which I want to roll the ball. Then I place the putter behind the ball, get my feet set, ready to go. And then I feel my shoulders do the work as I roll the ball down the target line. So being consistent in that setup, whether it's a three foot putt, six foot putt, and how many times do players walk up after you know, hitting a lag putt and they got two or three feet and they walk up and give it a little quick one and they miss. We've all done it. Stick to your routine, okay? Making sure that you're getting set up consistently every time. You're gonna feel the shoulders, I like to say, do the work. The arms, nice and relaxed. Again, place the putter, make sure it's lined up correctly. Then just trust the stroke. Keep the head steady, use the shoulders. You can use some aids and put some tape on your putter on, on opposite sides of the uh, sweet spot. Sweet spot to find here by the line on the back of the putter. You hit it off center, you're gonna feel the ball come off dead. There's so many great training aids out there like that. You need feedback. So using 
a station in your practice, extremely important. Otherwise, you know, we're, we're, I don't want to say wasting our time, but we want to set up consistently every time. And, you know, a couple little drills, you know, just working on distance control. This, this little mat has kind of a, uh, a little orange and black zone here. So if I want to practice, let's say uphill putts, I want to land the ball in the further zone. This is ideal here for flat putt, and this is for a little bit more downhill. So we're working on pace, but you know, simple drills. Just I, you know, I call it a ladder drill. There's lots of names out there for it, but just line your balls up, you know, set them a foot apart, and just work from your closest ball first, and then work your way back working on your speed. And if you control your speed and you control your line, you're gonna make a lot more putts. So working your way back, keep it consistent, roll the ball down the line and you'll see a lot more putts come in or dropping in. So Dave, a couple of questions for you there. Longer sure. putt, longer backswing and longer follow through or faster at the same distance? As the putts get longer, the backstroke is going to lengthen, but timing is going to stay the same. So if I'm okay. hitting a putt, let's say it's a, it's a three foot putt. Okay. My backstroke may only be this long, but the elapsed time from takeaway to impact is going to be the same. So okay. as I hit a 30 foot putt, it's tick tock, boom, boom. Okay. 40 foot, boom, boom. We keep that same rhythm. We don't get over the short ones and go really short and jab them. We have to have a flow. We have to have a rhythm to the putting stroke. We don't want to feel like we're hitting the ball, so to speak. We're just rolling the ball along the ground and I, we're creating that momentum and we need that length of backstroke to create that momentum. If we only take it back a few inches and try to hit it 20 feet, we're gonna be hitting it really hard and we're not gonna control our pace as well. And then what muscle group? I mean, a lot of people putt with their wrists and hands. It's, they think it's a small task, so it takes small muscles. Mm -hmm. But what muscle group, if you're trying to explain to somebody, is it in your shoulders or you literally feel like you're moving through your waist when you're putting? Where is the movement coming? I mean, the hands in your, your case stay pretty still, right? They absolutely do. I feel as though once I'm set, I've got my hands on the putter from the waist down perfectly still. My head is steady, but I feel like my shoulders are putting the putter in motion. Okay. I don't want to feel as though my wrist change angles. Obviously, if we're hitting a super long putt, maybe 100 feet or so, yes, we might need to pop it a little bit more, depending on speed of greens. But I try to feel as though I am completely locked in. It doesn't mean I'm tight, okay? I feel like my grip pressure is actually fairly light, but my wrists are very stable, okay? So I feel as though once I get set, grip pressure, very light, but I feel like my wrists are solid and my shoulders are going to create the stroke. Gotcha. One of the drills I'll do with a student is I'll have them actually hold an alignment rod over the shoulders for a right-handed player. And I'll actually hold, tell them, hold it here and use the shoulders to move the rod and the putter at the same time. We don't want to see the putter moving without the shoulders. There's a disconnect there, just like the full swing. If the arms and body get disconnected, we have problems. And what would you tell the crowd about uh, green reading? Um, where are we making most of the mistakes? Is it left or right? Is it short or long? Is it not appreciating, you know, whether we're putting against grain or what are the, what are your, your big sort of sense of uh, positives about green reading and what are the mistakes most of us make? Um, I would say players tend to under read, um, read break. Um, and I've used the line on the ball forever. I mean, ever since, you know, they started putting stamps on the side of the ball or use a Sharpie to draw a line on the ball. Um, I think it's important that we get feedback and, um, you know, there's 
you're going to hit plenty of good putts that don't go in. Okay. We have to understand that, you know, it's out of our control once we hit this putt. So it can hit a spike mark, bump, old, whatever, old pitch mark, you name it. There are plenty of things that can knock the ball offline. So in your practice, you know, we need to work our way around the hole. I like to say practicing right to left, left to right, and getting a feel for the speed at which, you know, and the amount of break that we're going to have, because um, if you don't train your eye, train the feel, when you get on the golf course, it's going to be difficult. But if you play the same golf course day in and day out, you're a member of the club or you have your favorite course that you play all the time, you're going to learn the greens and you're going to have a better feel for those greens. Um, you won't even have to take as much time to read it. You know, from playing you know, in some tour events over the years, you know, I was playing a practice round with Lee Jansen one year and we were down in, in uh, Puerto Rico. And he's walking around on the green. He's got his yardage book from the previous years. He goes, okay, one hole is going to be over here. Another one's going to be over there this round, you know. And, I mean, they mapped it out already. I mean, they know where it's going to be. They change it from time to time. But experience is extremely important. The more experience you have, the more practice you put in, the more effective green reader you're going to be. So, you know, it's an art form. I mean, it takes time. It takes practice. There are plenty of methods out there. But um, just going out and rolling some balls and just kind of getting a feel based on the pace of the green and the amount of slope, it, it's going to only make you a better putter because it's, it's frustrating to, to miss putts. We all do it. But like I said, using a line on the ball in your practice can give you a better idea. If you strike it solid and you strike it and you see the line rolling in a straight line, okay, then you know you've hit the putt the way you want it to. And if it breaks more to the left or to the right, or not as much as you think, then you know that you've actually misread the putt. Too often players don't know whether they actually started the ball in their intended line. So they're guessing, like, did I misread it or did I not start it on the correct line? We need to know what actually happens. If we don't, we're going to have a tough time. Got you. Look, uh, as we sort of wrap up here a little bit, uh, sort of a big picture question because you've been in the middle of this your entire professional career. Uh, what do you think about golf in Baltimore? Um, you know, we had the BMW here not long ago out at Caves that we were fortunate in providing the medical care for. It looks like there's some upgrades to sort of top in public golf and public golf courses in the area. Um, what do you think about golf in Baltimore? I mean, it's not traditionally thought of as, you know, a hotbed from a, from a, a national standpoint, but uh, how's the game growing, maybe growing in populations that haven't played traditionally? Uh, we're lucky at having some folks from the first tee here. Um, but how do you see golf growing in Baltimore and its future? I think golf is definitely on its way up in Baltimore. Uh, I know from, you know, just the past few years here at Pine Ridge, our rounds have increased. Everyone's rounds have increased. I mean, unfortunately due to COVID, but um, there's so many great facilities in our area, um, you know, whether it's public or private and there are, there's, you know, from, you know, the surrounding counties, there, there are so many great places to play. We're very fortunate and we have a pretty long season here as well. Um, I know from, from experience here, uh, we, if there's no snow on the ground, we still got folks out here playing golf. Um, so it's, it's a, um, you know, the, it certainly drives things when we have events like the BMW championship here. I think it, it piques your interest when, when you can actually go out and watch the best players in the world play live and in person, you gain a little better perspective for, for what they do um and you know just the popularity in general uh i know amateur golf there's going to be some some big events at baltimore country club um you know there's 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 so many great facilities around here uh you know and, and the public sector I, I think uh you know there's there's so many great teachers around in our area with tons of top top 100 teachers in this area uh we're very very fortunate and if, if you want to learn to play the game here in Baltimore, there's plenty of opportunity. Great. Uh, just a couple of questions that have come in from the audience. Um, one of them is, as a teacher, what have you found that are some of the most 
held on to beliefs that are false in golf, whether it's keep your head still, <laughs> always look at the back of the ball, et cetera. What, what things old wives tells don't work? What, what are some that do work that people come to you that they already have sort of ingrained? Well, you, you hit the nail on the head with one of them, keeping your head down. Um, you know, I see it all the time on the range and on the golf course from time to time too. When, when players, you can tell their swing is restricted because they're trying to make a golf swing and their head doesn't move and their body just does not rotate through to the target. Uh, leads to a, a number of different, you know, mishits. But, uh, you know, one of the other ones I, I hear all the time, especially teaching putting, is you know there are different schools of thought and this is just mine and and i've been fortunate enough to learn it from some some great people is you know straight back straight through you know trying to keep the putter going straight back and straight through during the stroke so for example when you when you try to keep the putter going straight back and straight through there's some manipulation that has to happen i've got to bend my elbows i've got to bend my wrists to kind of keep the putter square and go straight back and straight through this way. So I'm basically kind of blocking the putt. The putter has to swing open on the backswing and close on the follow through. It's square to its path. Okay. Not always square to the target line, but it's square to its path and the putter will be square at impact. That's the goal. So trying to keep the putter going straight back and straight through. Not a big fan of that one. I hear it all the time though. Got Leads to a lot of pushes, a lot of push putts to the right for the right-handed player. Good. Well, David, look, it's, it's been a real pleasure tonight. Uh, we were lucky at having you at one of our in-house educational events, and you were nice enough to come for the uh, lecture series tonight. And Just great information, and uh, I'm going to try to come spend some time with you sometime in the spring and uh, see if Please I can do. get a little bit better about what I'm trying to spend some hours on. So. <clears throat> It's been really great. It's been a great compliment to the other lectures we've had. I think your ability of, of playing at a high level, but then teaching a wide range of people leads some perspective that a lot of people just don't have. So thank you very much. I'm gonna turn it back over thank to Justin you. now and he's gonna introduce Gary Simpson, who is one of our physical therapists and athletic trainers really involved in the golf program and talk a little bit about the golf medicine program at MedStar and a little bit of our uh, association with TPI and their screening process. So I'll hand it over to you all. Thank you, Dr. Hinton and David. That was a wonderful conversation. Thank you. I am now gonna bring um, Gary on who is going to go over MedStar athletic training department programs. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, as Dr. Hinton, Hinton men mentioned, my name is Gary Simpson. I am one of the athletic trainers working with the MedStar Golf Medicine Program. Thank you so much to uh, Mr. David Hutzel for being on. Um, I certainly took a few tips from him, and I'm, I'm sure everyone else did too. Um, just as a quick background, MedStar Golf Medicine has kind of built into um, an entire cadre of local experts that are um, physicians, physical therapists, athletic trainers, um, strength and conditioning coaches that have sort of evolved into a kind of a local leader in both, you know, high level golf event um, tournament coverage, as well as you know, working with golfers of all levels um, to get kind of back on the course in um, a pain-free way and with and with more physical capabilities that you need to, to kind of play the best that you possibly can. That's our only goal. Um, one of the ways that we analyze um, the connection of your body and, uh, to your swing is through what's called a Titleist Performance Institute screening. Um, that TPI screening uh, allows us to sort of um, determine uh, any physical deficits you might have uh, that could be limiting you from a more like fluid and consistent swing. Um, one of the more common biomechanical flaws we see when we do our TPI screenings is um, that sort of lack of mobility in our thoracic spine, um, commonly known as sort of that mid back area, like below your neck, but above your kind of lower back or lumbar spine. Um, so because we see it so frequently and we're coming sort of uh, 
you know, to the tail end of the season of golf weather wise here in Maryland. Um, we figured we could get, at least give you one tip as we go into the off season to kind of help you improve that T-spine mobility since it is sort of one of those more common biomechanical flaws. Um, so in just a second here, we're going to actually cut to one of those TPI videos with Greg Rose, who's an amazing uh, resource um, for golfers of any level. Um, so let's go um, take just one minute here and shoot over to that um, Greg Rose video, and he's gonna show you how to really get that thoracic spine mobilized. This is a great um, exercise to open up your thoracic spine. Just go ahead and lay on your side, bring your knees up, take one, your lower hand, put on top of your top, what's it called? Sorry. Open book. This is called open books. This is a great exercise to open up your thoracic spine. Just go ahead and lay on your side, bring your knees up, take one, your lower hand, put on top of your top leg, take your top hand, put it out to your left side. From here, you can put a pillow underneath your head if you want. And from here, you're just going to open the cover of the book, just like that. And go back and forth, take a big breath in, breathe out. Try and get that shoulder down on the ground. Let's do it again. Keep these knees up. Don't let them drift down. That'll get more in your lower back. The higher these are, that's more in your middle back. And go ahead and flip over and get the other side. That's called open books. So as you can tell from that demonstration, um, we love that drill because, you know, not only as we mentioned, it's a super common flaw that we see, but it's so, so simple to do. There's not many, um, there's not many technical cues that you can mess up. It takes zero equipment. You can do it in um, your own home before you go out for, for a round or just as you're working on things in the off season. So that's one we utilize pretty frequently. So feel free to keep that one in your back pocket if you need it. That TPI website that was just displayed here on the screen is a great resource for anybody who kind of wants to work on some things. And to take it one step further, you can break it down by any type of body part, physical limitation you might be dealing with, any kind of swing flaw, and it'll kind of show you the appropriate videos for each of those. Um, so there's one thing to take with you. Um, if you feel like you're interested in, in one of those TPI screenings that we talked about, you can certainly respond to our follow-up email that we'll be sending out after the completion of this video. And then we also have our golf and sports medicine hotline, which is that 1-800-844-SPORT number. And then that'll get directed to our golf medicine program. If you're interested in getting to a doctor or a physical therapist, athletic trainer, or strength and conditioning professional that can, uh, that can help you get back on the course and hopefully um, decrease that score a little. I know that's what we're all looking for. So I'm going to hand it back over uh, to our host, Lil, and uh, she'll take it from there. Thanks, guys. Thanks, so Lou, just one quick uh, jump in here. This is Dr. Hent again. Just as far as TPI, uh, this is not for public uh, knowledge yet, but we are probably going to have uh, Greg Rose and his staff will be coming from San Diego to Baltimore to our facility out at U.S. Lacrosse uh, in the spring for both a level three course, which is the first time they've been off of their San Diego campus to do a level three course and also level one teaching for TPI. So uh, more information on that to come, but we've started that conversation with Greg and his group. Thank you, Dr. Hinton. Um, we will also be sharing that information that Dr. Hinton mentioned, as well as a recording of this and the TPI link to the email for everybody that's joining us this evening. Next, we'd like to present March who is going to give us a brief summary of the first T Kids Golf Program. Hi everyone, my name is March Klein. I'm the program director from First T Greater Baltimore. I want to thank Justin for inviting me to this. I've already learned so many putting tips. Thanks, David. Um, and it, it's been great to hear. I'm excited to learn more about the TPI um, training too. That's coming up in the spring. One thing that we, I also work at Five Iron Golf Baltimore downtown on Central and Eastern, and we have 11 indoor golf simulators, plus um, some really good flatbreads and lots of drinks too. So we're not really in our, we're not really going to be off for the winter. Um, you can always go down and hone up your practice at Five Iron. But um, mainly here to talk about First Tee Greater Baltimore. We are a kids program at First Tee. We guide kids 
and teens to show up stronger in everything they do. We do this through the game of golf, which I love so much. And I'm going to go through um, some of our program. Um, I'll just show a bit of our slideshow that we um, send out to our donors. Can everybody see this? Um, what we have here on our first um, page is, if you really just pay attention to the pictures, these are some of the facilities that we use. The top picture of the girl who's chipping, this is our facility at Clint, uh, Clifton Park, which was our original facility when first tea started uh, about 15 years ago um, through a generous grant from Constellation Energy. We still use this facility um, now. Um, we're, we're working a little bit on improving the area around, make it safer, fun for kids, um, and hopefully we'll see some improvements in that. Um, the middle picture is our girls golf program uh, where we bring we have classes just for girls. We are hosted by Eagles Nest Country Club. And then our bottom picture is one of our school programs, Baltimore Lab School. Um, and they're practicing at Forest Park. So we have kids from all over Baltimore, not just uh, Baltimore City, but also from the schools. We have some community um, programs that we lead programs in, and then we have a lot of schools where the PE teachers uh, lead the program using our equipment. Um, here we have Justin came to our facility at Ruggles. This is our newest program. It's up at Aberdeen Proving Grounds. We received a grant from the Patriot Fund to open up a new program in Harford County. Here we are using our warm up that, that we learned from Justin and the MedStar um, staff. We use this in all of our classes. Um, and then we have this one class that's, that wasn't girls golf, but it ended up to be all girls and they just, love everything about golf. So we're excited to see them this winter at our indoor um, facilities. Um, we have our Halloween pictures, which just happened. We make a little putting course. This is at, at Clifton Park. The kids dress up in costumes and then we make like a haunted putting green for them. These are some of the um, ideas that we talk about. We emphasize the nine core values of first tee um, in each of our classes. And then we try to catch the kids displaying them or talk about them during the class while we're teaching golf skills. Um, this is our other learning center at Forest Park. Um, that was given to us through the Caves Valley Foundation. Um, so when we talk about the um, BMW championship coming back in 2025, or um, the amateur tournaments that are coming through Baltimore Country Club. These are our biggest partners and, and we like to bring our kids out to see those events and then we try to fundraise through them. Um, here's a little bit about our community and our school programs. Um, this is one of our schools learning at Forest Park. Um, and then our, our newest um, endeavor is called the Baltimore Caddy Academy. We've expanded on our original vision from 2015 um, to now it's come, become more of a camp, an overnight camp at McDonough School and the kids caddy during the day. And then at night they learn about social emotional learning or they learn some college prep. We have all sorts of counselors who come and help them talk about finances. What, what are they gonna do with a pocket full of cash that they just got today? How are they going to manage that? Are they gonna spend it all? So we have a lot of um, volunteers who come and help us with those. Um, and we're always looking for volunteers. So you don't really have to be great at golf. You just need to be great with kids and really want to let, uh, learn about them and most importantly, mentor them um, while, you know, while you're talking about golf to them. Um, does anybody have any questions? How many kids in the Baltimore area do you touch a year? Do you work with and uh, sort of what's the scope as far as the numbers? So that's a great question. There's lots of different ways we count them. We have 
just like I was saying before, we have many different programs. So in our green grass classes at Clifton Park, uh, Mount Pleasant, um, Forest Park, and we're gonna start Carroll Park again. We have about 439 students. And then we also go to schools. This year, we've been going to Seed School, San Ignatius, Baltimore Lab School, Beach um, Tree Elementary. And, that, and so we hit all of the kids that go through different PE classes there. And then we also have a new partnership with the Boys and Girls Club at Callaway Elementary. This just started a few weeks ago. Um, and we're hoping to build a new partnership with them, take, take those kids out. They're really close to Forest Park. So we have a van now and we're gonna try to bring them out to Forest Park before it gets too cold, show them what it's like to hit um, on a driving range and then maybe take them out on the golf course. So we have like different progressions. The school programs and the community centers are generally going through their gym or in a church. Uh, church gym, those kind of locations at Baltimore Lab School. Sometimes I teach them in the parking lot. Um, and then if they have they transportation, have we can take them out to our facilities and then they really get the golf bug. You know, it's a lot different using a plastic club and a tennis ball and then going to a metal club and a golf ball and hitting out into the open. And that really gets the kids really excited about golf. Yeah. Well, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. My son has gone through the first tee, Cole Zimmerman, and oh, yeah. I've seen tremendous growth from him in the past year of just all the teaching and just getting out there in the courses. So I just want to thank you for everything that you do for kids um, because I've seen him when he first started off to barely been able to hit the ball to now going out there and actually been able to play nine holes of golf in a regular tea setting format and, and enjoy it. So thank you for that. Yeah, sure. Tell them I said hi. That's so great to hear about that. Uh, maybe at the end for the email that you're sending out, you can um, link our email when, to our website so that you can um, check it out a little bit more. And there's some registration pages. If you have kids, we're going to start our winter programming in January and the registration will go up in December. Yeah, or absolutely. We can get that information out. Yep. Great. Not a problem. Thank Thanks. you. Mom. We will. Um, Dr. Hinton, feel free to close this out, please. Uh, Justin, are you with us? He may, he had another, uh, I think, a family engagement he had to get to. But look, this is um, this is another great uh, lecture here in the series that we're looking at. Um, again, wonderful guests tonight, and this uh, program gets repurposed and is recorded and gets used for education both throughout MedStar and other sport uh, organizations that we uh, partner with and, and at various places in the community. So, uh, Marge, you and uh, David are not just touching the people here tonight, but many more that will be seeing this in some form in the future. Um, so I want to thank everybody for taking the time. You can't have a talk if you don't have an audience. So thank all of you all who tuned in tonight. And again, thank you very much for our two guests. And Lul, thank you for shepherding us through the evening. And we look forward to our next chat in the spring. And like I say, we'll keep you posted on the TPI uh, instructional course coming to Baltimore in the spring and our other educational events. So everybody have a good time and really appreciate you being with us tonight. David, thanks again for taking your time. I know you got a lot on your plate. So thanks Thank a lot. Thank you. My pleasure. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. We will be sending out the recording. Have a wonderful evening. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.